All right, everybody. Well, thank you guys for making your way to the sanctuary for Sunday school today. <clears throat> we do plan to be back in the gym next week at 2 o'clock, but we're glad to have this place to do this as well. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with us to the book of Isaiah, chapter 2. Isaiah, chapter 2. And we've set ourselves perhaps a too ambitious goal for today, but we will, we will do whatever we can to try to at least get the big idea in place. And we will pray in just a moment. The, the big concern, so if you've been around for the last few weeks, we've been dealing with the controversy of the millennium, <clears throat> the thousand-year reign of Christ in Revelation chapter 20. And we've talked about dispensational premillennial, premillennialism, historic premillennialism, amillennialism, and then postmillennialism last week. And one of the big arguments for uh, either view of premillennialism comes from how to interpret texts in the Old Testament concerning the future of Israel. So how we understand the texts in the Old Testament that predict the future of Israel, these obviously come primarily in the prophets. And the, the most notable prophets that we're going to be lingering on today would be Isaiah and Ezekiel. Uh, we may not even be able to cover all we want to cover there. Certainly we won't. But Isaiah and Ezekiel will be the two prophets we will look at since they are so important for the New Testament and how the New Testament writers think and uh, where they quote from. Papa Fred, could I ask you to pray for us and then we will jump in. Father, thank you for um, this opportunity to open your word to these ancient texts in Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, and other uh, Old Testament books that are just um, full of allusions to your second coming into the new heavens and the new earth. So be with us this afternoon. Uh, we need your spirit. We need your help. And uh, fill us, Father, from your word. Amen. Amen. Um, so th this is a little bit hard to try to even untangle what the problem is precisely. Uh, I'll go ahead and state one of the things that I believe is here in the Bible, and especially you'll see it fleshed out in the New Testament, that I think begins to shed some light on how to interpret some of these passages. And one thing is this, this some of these ideas may be a little, take a little time to think through. There are times in the Old Testament, I'm convinced, where an Old Testament prophet speaks of the future New Covenant era that we live in and that will finally reach its uh, final fulfillment at the return of Christ and the new creation. There are times when the Old Testament prophets speak of those new covenant realities using idealized Old Covenant categories. Now, that may sound totally, what do you mean by that? Speaking of the future with idealized uh, Old Covenant categories in mind, I just want to give you kind of a, a little bit of a sample here. We'll read a few verses and then we'll, we'll explain a little bit more. Uh, Isaiah chapter 2, and Greg, could you read verses 1 through 5? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Isaiah chapter 2, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So ju just to try, before we try to explain what we think is happening in these four verses, five verses, look at verse four, and I want to try to give you, a, I think, a rather simple example of the kind of thing we're talking about. Let's, let's reread verse four. <clears throat> he shall judge between the nations and shall des decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, I have a whole book that's called, uh, named after the plowshares and the pruning hooks uh, verse here, and it tries to describe this in more detail. See if this makes sense. When Isaiah is writing what he is writing, the most common weapon of warfare would be swords and spears, right? We're, we're talking the year 700 BC. So when you're in war, you're going to have a sword, 
You may have a spear. Those are the common weapons of warfare of Isaiah's day. <clears throat> and the common farming equipment of their day would include pruning hooks, and it would include plowshares. Now, in today's language, would we speak of warfare as being something about swords and spears? No, we might talk about tanks. We might talk about you know, B B-52s, we might talk about different kinds of weapons of warfare than they used back then. But what Isaiah is saying is, at, on the last day, the weapons of warfare will be turned into weapons of peace. They, they, they will no longer have any purpose for bloodshed. They will be turned into farming equipment because that's the only purpose you'll have for those things. That's clearly the meaning of what he's saying. But do you see how Isaiah is using the language of his day to express something in the future that will transcend the language of his day? What I mean, what I mean is, when Christ comes back, is the primary weapon going to be swords and spears? No. It's going to be some other kind of weaponry. And is the primary farming equipment going to be plowshares and pruning hooks? No. I mean, when Jesus comes back, it might be more accurate to say we'll be, you know, melting down our tractors into com our, our, our tanks into combines and our, you know, whatever, our, our, our jets into, into other kinds of, uh, kinds of instruments of, of, uh, of farming equipment. But the point is, Isaiah uses the language and categories of his own day in 700 B.C., to express a future reality that goes beyond and transcends the, the language of his own day. Now, do you, do you understand what I'm saying here? So, he's expressing worldwide peace, he's expressing the end of war, but he uses the, 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 the language of his own day to do so. And I'm going to argue that the prophets do this kind of thing with, with a lot of regularity. And as we move into the time of fulfillment in Jesus, how exactly these things are fulfilled may look a little different than you might have suspected at first glance. So, uh, Gregor, Papa, Papa. Actually, Micah uses the, the identical same words uh, up through the uh, swords and plowshares and spears and the, and the pruning, pruning hooks. And, of course, he's much later than, than uh, Isaiah. Right. And uh, those words are actually on the United Nations building really? in New York. Uh, and they say, oh, beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither they shall they learn war anymore. Of course, that was done at the beginning of the 20th century, and we know what happened in the 20th century. So that's obviously a time beyond now. Right. Well, another, another thing to consider is we're trying to, to make sense of how the New Testament fulfills Old Testament prophecy. Um, going back to what Mark said, you think, again, in terms of Old Testament categories, um, oftentimes the New Testament takes these Old Testament categories and it brings them together into one point. Like, it, they all converge together, especially into Christ. Like, you think of just the offices of prophet, of priest, of king, and you think what goes into the whole priestly office, there's the sacrificial system, there's the structures of the temple, the altar, everything like that. All of these Old Testament categories and the details uh, that, that build them and make them up um, converge in Jesus. He's not, you, know, you can't separate Jesus out and say, okay, a third of Jesus is, the, like it doesn't work that way. And so the, the realities that the Old Testament are pointing to are far greater than themselves. They can't fully, in one image, encapsulate everything that we're going to see in Jesus that he's going to do for us and fulfill for us. And so when we, we read the Old Testament text like this, you know, judge between nations, people, you know, he'll decide disputes. But, you know, let, let's go up even further and let's, let's read, you know, it shall come to pass, and this is verse 2, in the latter days, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, lifted up above the hills, all the nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the house of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Um, and so you, you think about, you know, we've made the case, and there's a lot we can't go back and cover again for time's sake, but Jesus is the one who fulfills all these Old Testament hopes and categories and institutions. Like it all comes together in him. That's why we can say he's, he's, a, he's both our priest and our sacrifice. Um, you know, he's, he's our king, he's our shepherd. He's, all of these things are true of Jesus at the same time. But from an Old Testament perspective, you can't quite put all that together in one person until the person comes. Another thing we need to keep in mind is the whole issue of typology, which we've talked about. Like, with the issue of typology is you see 
not just straightforward predictions in the Old Testament, like your king is going to enter on a, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, or he'll be born in Bethlehem. That's straightforward predictive prophecy. There's other ways that the Old Testament points forward to the future. And this, like I said, is in terms of, of institutions, offices, but also patterns that repeat but are escalated in their fulfillment in Jesus. And so we talk about the nations flowing to Jerusalem because that's where God is. They want to learn his law. You know, think Jesus at the Great Commission. What does he say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So the law, as Mark talked about in his sermon, I think it was a few weeks ago, about how um, you know, we, we are under the law of Christ. Guess what? Jesus isn't somehow separated from the God of the Old Testament. He is the God of the Old Testament and the son of that God. You know, we're not going to get into the mysteries of the Trinity right now, but it's not like Jesus is somehow separated from the, from the Lord in the Old Testament. He is the Lord. He's Yahweh. Um, and so when we talk about the law of Yahweh, we can talk about the law of Yahweh and the law of Christ. Now, there are some distinctions, but it's not like we're talking about two different gods or like two completely different things here. It's like we've got to keep in mind the unity of God himself in the Old and the New Testaments and his, his plans and his promises. It's not like Jesus comes in and introduces something entirely new. Like he fulfills what he himself promised. He fulfills what he himself planned. And so keep that in mind when we're reading Old Testament texts. These categories are pointing forward to Jesus. And so we can't really understand the fullness of what God's promising until the fullness comes in Christ. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 60. So we'll move toward the latter part of the book, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 60. And th this is a chapter that is normally seen as being fulfilled in the millennium for, from the premillennial perspective. And um, let, let's look at this and let's try to figure out how the New Testament would interpret a passage like this. So I'll start in verse 1 of Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and His glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant, your heart shall thrill and exult because of the abundance of the sea it shall be turned to you, the wealth of the nations shall come to you, a multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come, they shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you, the rams of Naboth uh, shall minister to you, they shall come up with acceptance on my altar and how I will beautify uh, my beautiful house." And it continues here, look at verse 11, your gates shall be open continually day and night, they shall not be shut, that people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with the kings led in procession. Anytime you see the statement, your gates shall be open continually, that never happened except in the new heavens and the new earth. The purpose of the gates were to keep the bad guys out, and now kings and and princes and people from all over the earth will come to the holy city. So, excuse me. No, that's good. So, so if, uh, hold, we're not going to be done with Isaiah, but hold your spot there and turn to the very end of the Bible and try to hold it so you can see both passages maybe even at the same time, or you can flip back and forth between them. If you look at the, like, look at Revelation 21. <clears throat> so, now we are clearly past the millennium. We are now in the eternal state of the new creation. And let's see how John sees Isaiah 60 being fulfilled. And Fred just alluded to, alluded to this. Look at the description of this new city, of the new Jerusalem. Look at verse 10. Uh, Revelation 21, verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming out, down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And then it mentions all these wonderful stones. And skip all the way down to verse 22. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, 
Now, that sounds like Isaiah 60. By its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. That's from Isaiah 60. And its gates shall never be shut. Again, Isaiah 60. And there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay, so if you feel like, okay, what, what exactly are we talking about right now? The argument is that Isaiah 60 is predicting something that happens before the new creation, before the new heavens and new earth, during the so-called thousand-year reign of Christ before the, before the new creation. And the argument is that Isaiah 60, this idea of Jerusalem being exalted, its gates not having to be closed day and night, the kings of the earth bringing their treasures and glory into, the, into, the, into this renewed Jerusalem, that's going to take place before final judgment, before new heavens and new earth, during the, the millennial reign of Christ. That's the argument. But the problem with that argument, at least a problem, is that John, writing Revelation, doesn't make allusions to Isaiah 60 in the millennium passage in chapter 20. He makes allusions to Isaiah 60 where? In the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and new earth. Which makes me think John is not seeing Isaiah 60 fulfilled in Revelation 20 where the millennium takes place because there is no allusion to this text in Revelation 20. Where is the allusion? It's in the new creation, the new Jerusalem. This makes me think that a very famous premillennial passage, so-called Isaiah 60, is actually seen by John as being fulfilled in the new Jerusalem, not in an earthly Jerusalem in the future during a thousand-year literal reign of Christ on earth. So we're going to keep going with this, but there are many examples of these kinds of passages supposedly being about an earthly millennial reign that John actually alludes to in the eternal state, not in the millennium. Greg? Well, and it goes back to a, a principle I mentioned. I uh, can't remember how many weeks ago it was. It's like we want to let the Bible speak for itself. We don't want to force the New Testament authors into a mold that they don't fit, into an interpretation that they themselves don't have. And again, we're, you know, the premillennial position, especially um, you know, the dispensational position, pushes for this even harder than the historic premill do. Um, it's like there has to be this millennium. There has to be this thousand-year literal earthly kingdom in Jerusalem. There has to be, has to be, has to be, has to be. It is assumed. It's presupposed. It's not even questioned. I look through. Um, I've got two main commentaries that I look at. It's kind of, okay, make sure I'm understanding positions rightly. I've got one by MacArthur, and I've got another one. It's called the Bible Knowledge Commentary. It was written by uh, folks at Dallas Seminary a while back, and it's completely from a premillennial perspective. And I'm like, okay, how do, how do they, how do they see this? How do they deal with this? Um, and the millennium is assumed into this text. Like they don't, like they can't talk about Isaiah without talking about the millennium first. And it's like, number one, that's a little fishy. You want to talk about the text in its own context before you start bringing other stuff in. You want to make sense of what's going on there. Um, so that's already read into it so that when they actually get to Revelation 20, 21, and 22, they've already made their minds up about what it can and can't say. And one of the reasons why I can't go to the premillennial, especially the dispensational perspective, is because the New Testament authors do not do with the Old Testament what the dispensationalists say those authors should do. Every time I come to the New Testament, the authors are doing something different than they say. And so they assume that all of this is millennium. But we get to the millennium, like Mark said, it's not there. It's new heavens, new earth, new creation. It's not in that millennial period, however you describe it. And so when I see something like that, that says, you know what? And I'm not trying to be like overly antagonistic with this, but I'm going to go with John before I go with somebody else's presuppositions about what that text can and can't say. And so let the New Testament speak for itself in terms of how it handles Old Testament prophecy. We can't tell Jesus and the apostles what they have to mean, and then they say something different, and we're stuck trying to figure, oh, well, I don't know. Like, let them speak for themselves. Let the New Testament interpret the Old Testament and tell us where the Old Testament was intended to go. The more I do that, the more I am unconvinced of the premillennial, especially the dispensational perspective. Yeah, if, if you can flip back to Isaiah 60, if you're kind of holding your text there, look, look at Isaiah 60 verse 19 and see how similar it sounds to the new heavens and new earth, the new Jerusalem. Isaiah 60 verse 19, the, sh the sun shall be no more. Does that sound familiar? Your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light. And your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, 
and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall, be all, shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever. I mean, this, John sees this fulfilled not in a literal earthly Jerusalem this side of eternity, but in a renewed Jerusalem on the other side of eternity when God brings about complete restoration uh, of this world. Well, the millennium is never described in those terms. And, right. and, and so, again, scripture to interpre interpreting scripture, mm -hmm. we have to go with Isaiah 60 and compared to uh, Revelation 21. Now, let, let me take you to one of the harder ones. This is Isaiah 65. And um, just as an example, a few years ago, and, and uh, John Piper was preaching, and he, John Piper would be historic premillennial, not dispensational premillennial if you're keeping these things straight. But John Piper was speaking at a big conference a few years ago, and he, was, he, he went to Isaiah 65 and said, listen, I know a lot of you in the audience are amillennialists like we are. <laughs> I know there's a lot of amillennialists in this room right now. He said, but listen, I don't think Isaiah 65 fits amillennialism. I think this is clearly historic premillennialism, and we'll try to explain what he means. I, I don't agree with him, but, but here, here's the text that Piper went to. Isaiah 65, verse 17. Now, uh, just as a clue that we're talking about eternity is the very first verse, in my opinion. Uh, behold, this is Isaiah 65, verse 17. Behold, I create new heavens and new earth. For the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Well, let me just footnote here. This is not the point. But some people think we get a memory wipe when we enter into eternity because of this verse. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. That is not what this verse means. Look at the previous verse, verse 18, 16, to understand what he's saying. Look at the end of verse 16. Because the former troubles are forgotten and are hidden from my eyes. He means the, 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 you will no longer remember your miseries in the sense that they will no longer be a, an active experience in your life. It's just like when Jesus said, when a woman is in labor, she feels great agony. But as soon as the baby is born, she forgets her labor pains. My wife would say, well, I, I didn't really forget my labor pains. <laughs> Uh, but th Jesus doesn't mean you don't have cognitive awareness that you had labor pains. He means when the joy of the baby comes, the labor pains seem as nothing now compared to this child. That, that, that's what he means. When, when the new heavens and new earth gets here, we don't have a memory wipe. It's not like we forget our previous life. No way. Not at all. But instead, the miseries of the previous life are, are wiped away. He wipes the tears from our eyes. We're no longer in agony anymore. That, that's the idea. So we're, I think we're talking clearly about the new creation in verse 17, verse 18. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. Now, do you hear again? I think we're talking about New Jerusalem. Now, this next part gets tricky because Piper's going to say, what do you do with 20, 21, 22? These are hard verses from our perspective. Verse 20, if this is talking about heaven, the new creation... Verse 20 doesn't quite fit, does it? No more shall there be in it, in Jerusalem, an infant, an infant who lives but a few days. Now, just stop there. Wait, babies aren't going to be born in heaven at all. So what do you mean there's not going to be an infant who only lives a few days? There's not going to be any infants whatsoever. I mean, we, I, I'm not talking about infants going to heaven. I'm talking about whether or not children will be born in the eternal state. There is neither marriage nor giving in marriage in heaven. So the marriage is between Christ and his church. There's no longer a need for physical earthly marriage. Therefore, there is no longer going to be the production of children. So what do you mean there's not going to be an infant who only lives a few days? Verse 20, or an old man who does not fill out his days, for the young man shall die a hundred years old. And the sinner, a hundred years old, shall be accursed. Wait, there's sinners and there's people dying at a hundred in heaven? What? They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Greg, do you want, do you want to take a shot at this? Because I'm happy to talk a little bit more. But You go ahead. I'm still, okay, there's okay. a few things I want to say, but you go first. So, so th this is, I, I admit that this is difficult. And it's not something I want to take lightly. Piper says, listen, when it says if a man dies at 100, he would be considered accursed, that still means someone's going to die, which means we're not yet at the final resurrection. We're not actually in the new heavens and new earth. We're in the millennium, which is going to be in the future from us, but before the new creation where people actually can still die and where pe some people are still sin and where not everyone is actually saved, but it's, it's largely uh, an idealized situation that we're in. And, and, and I want to say, okay, I get that. Piper even said, if this is poetry for resurrection, why does he speak about death at all in this sense? Why not just say, there is no death? Uh, and just hold your spot. T turn to Isaiah 26. So we'll stay in Isaiah for a second. Isaiah 26, back a number of chapters here. Isaiah chapter 20. 
Let's start in 25. Just read a couple verses that are probably somewhat familiar to us. I think this is describing the same moment in time, but Isaiah 25, verse 6. Again, we're in Jerusalem. 25, verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine. This is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Of rich food, of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. And he shall swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all the earth. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people will be taken away from the earth. And the Lord God, for the Lord God has spoken. Look at chapter 26, verse 19. <clears throat> Very next chapter, verse 19. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. So clearly, Isaiah does believe in final resurrection. So what do we do with chapter 65 and this discussion here of the, the person dying at 100 possibly? I'll give an illustration and then I'll try to explain what I mean. This is from someone else, but I think it makes some sense, okay? Imagine over 100 years ago when everyone's riding around in horse and buggy. You remember those days, Papa Fred? Papa I did. Fred remembers those days from his youth. And when they're riding around those horse and buggies. I was born buggies, in a buggy. <laughs> <laughs> they're riding around a horse and buggy. And I, mean, I, I remember I have a picture of my grandfather as, an, as a baby, and they had a, literally a horse-drawn carriage, like, like right there in black and white photo. It's incredible. And so imagine you're born when there's horse and buggy. That's all anyone has. And then let's say that the son is five or six years old, and he says, Dad, I really can't wait to have my own you know, transportation. I can't wait to have my own horse, my own buggy, my own little carriage. And the dad says, okay, listen, when you are 16 or 18 or whatever, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you your own mode of transportation. I'll get you your horse and buggy. And then let's say over the next 10 years, uh, let's say the Model T, I don't remember what year, but let's say the Model T let's get, hits mass production. And suddenly there's affordable cars that, you know, the horseless carriage, right? The, you got this incredible <laughs> thing, the carriage with no horse. How does this work? It has horsepower, but there's no horses. And so the, you got these, these cars are on the manufacturing line and they start being mass produced and they're, they're relatively affordable. Imagine the dad buys an actual car, a Model T for his son and gives it to him on his 16th birthday. His son could say, dad, this is not what you said you would give me. You said you'd get me transportation, but you said it would be a horse and buggy. And the dad could say, yes, I was using the language of our day to express what would later transcend the categories of that moment. You wouldn't have understood. If I would have said I was going to buy you a Model T 10 years ago, you wouldn't have even known what a Model T was. So I use the language of your day, the, the mode of transportation of your day, a horse and buggy, to describe that which transcends the horse and buggy. The, the dad has not lied. This is so crucial. The dad has not lied when he buys a car for his 16-year-old son, when he promised him a horse and buggy. What he's done is he's given him the even better transcendent, better reality that the horse and buggy is only a shadow or, or pointing to. Now, when Isaiah writes some parts of these passages, I believe he's using the idealized categories of his day in Jerusalem. Every man has his own, every man has his own vine and sits under his own fig tree. I don't think in heaven that's going to be necessarily the primary thing we're doing is literally sitting under grapes, okay? But maybe there is some of that. But he's using the idealized picture of Jerusalem in his day. A person living to 100 would be amazing in Isaiah's day. A person sitting under his own fig tree and vine would be amazing in Isaiah's day. He's using the idealized picture of his own day, the horse and buggy language of his day, to point to a reality that is going to transcend his own day, which is actually going to be a cosmic renewed Jerusalem with everlasting life and resurrection that he foreshadows earlier in the book that is going to go beyond. The, the, the categories existent in his own time and day. Well, this also plays into um, the misunderstanding that the Jews had when Jesus came. Like they were expecting, right. we've been, we know this, this is like common knowledge almost, or it should be, I hope, that you know, when Messiah comes, Messiah is going to conquer. He's going to destroy all the enemies of the people of God in a, a physical battle right then and there. And Jerusalem's going to be free. And, you know, they meant, well, that means no more Rome, this, that, and the other. And he consistently um, foiled their expectations. That's one of the reasons they, they didn't believe him. They, 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 didn't, they, they took these things overly literally for right one moment right then and they missed that he was fulfilling them exactly as God planned, but they, they missed it. They absolutely missed it. Messiahs aren't crucified. That's a sign of weakness, not a sign of strength. That's not how you save people. You save people by what? Conquering their enemies. You know, their physical earthly enemies expressed in armies and corrupt leaders and stuff like that. And so even with Jesus himself, we see that 
a lot of people got it wrong because they were expecting the Old Testament to be fulfilled in a way that it wasn't going to be fulfilled. Same thing here. <clears throat> and I love that. I love that illustration. Again, like how, how do you how do you explain something that you don't really have categories for except in categories that you can make sense of? Like, for instance, when we talk about God, like mm -hmm. we do this with God, like, you know, God isn't made up of parts where, you know, because we think like of the attributes of God, God's love, he's got, you know, God's grace, God's justice, righteousness, wrath, holiness, you know, all that. We think we, we, we tend to break things up into this part, this part, this part. And so we say, okay, well, part of God's, no, God's all that at the same time. But how can you talk about a being who is all that at the same time, except by breaking, okay, well, this is an aspect of who he is. And we, as time-bound creatures, have to break things up into manageable pieces. Um, and I, th I think we do that in a way here because we don't have categories really for, for expressing um, someone like God, who's, who, you know, he's not phys a physical being, he's a spiritual being. And so it's like we can't really understand someone who who is everywhere, fully present in every place, in the exact same way, the exact same amount. Now, we have to talk in finite, limited terms to describe something that's outside of what we're used well, to. Can I jump in on yeah. that point? So think of a verse in the Old Testament that says, the Lord has eyes that run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is right toward Him. Now, if you take that verse bare as a literalism, you're going to end up in some kind of heresy that God the Father mm -hmm. has literal physical eyes that He's zooming around the earth to try to find things. It's using language we can ears. understand. Yeah, he's, he's using yeah he got God's ears. He hears. He smelled the pleasing aroma. Went into his nostrils. He smelled it. Uh, these are all that you. It's called anthropomorphic language, where you use human language that we understand to describe God that transcends the language that we understand. And so God doesn't literally have eyes. God the Father doesn't literally have ears. Literally a nose. But they use the human characteristics so that it can kind of put the cookies on the bottom shelf, mm -hmm. so we can access a little bit of what God is like. Well, well, similarly here, look at Isaiah 65, verse 25. Isaiah 65, verse 25. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. Again, this representing Satan, ultimately, his triumph over him. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Now, look, look at the next chapter. Isaiah 65, the last chapter of Isaiah. 66. Excuse me, 66. Thank you. Isaiah chapter 66. And look at how, again, the new creation is described, I think, using Old Covenant categories. And I know there's ways to try to ex explain this away, but I don't know that they are convincing. Look at verse 22. This is the, well, look at verse 21. Look at the very end. This is describing the new heavens and new earth, verse 21. And some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. Are, are we going to have Levites, Levitical priests in the, the eternal state? I don't, I don't think so. Verse 22, for as the new heavens... And the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your offspring and your name remain from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath. All flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worms shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Now, are there really going to be the Jewish monthly new moon feasts that we're going to be celebrating throughout all of eternity in the new creation? No, those... Are we going to be celebrating the Sabbath every Saturday in heaven? No, I, I don't think so. But So why is the new heavens and new earth described as being a thing that goes from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath? Isaiah is using the idealized language of his own day to describe what will transcend the language of his day. What, what do I mean by that? All the Jewish feasts and ceremonies, all the Sabbaths are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, our true rest. Right? We find our Sabbath in Jesus. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath rest. If you want to find real rest, you can only find it in me. If you are stressed out by life, come to me. I will give you rest. I'll give you peace. I'll give you life. The Sabbath as a weekly event is a foreshadowing of the rest we have in Jesus. And when Isaiah says, for all of eternity, from Sabbath to Sabbath, we'll be worshiping God, he doesn't mean that we're going to be literally holding to Sabbatarian laws, the Jewish laws, on Saturday from Friday, from Friday night at sunset till Saturday night at sunset. That's not what he means. He means whatever Sabbath and these new moons are pointing to, ultimately we will find its fulfillment in an unforeseen way. 
Because Jesus, the Messiah himself, is our Sabbath rest. He himself is going to be what all these festivals were pointing to. That They are not going to be literalistically fulfilled in actual Jewish ceremonies in eternity, but they're going to be fulfilled ultimately in, in Jesus. Well, the verse you read, um, 65, 25, the wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. That's, that's paradise. Mm-hmm. That doesn't, that's not true today. But and, and at least Isaiah is addressing that particular situation. And, and clearly that's the new heavens and the new earth. And, and w- one more reason to think that. Look at verse 24, last verse of Isaiah, 65, 24. Again, and they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me for their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. When Jesus describes the eternal state of hell in Mark chapter 9, He quotes this verse. Jesus says, their worm shall not die and their fire will not be quenched. Um, Isaiah uses, okay, again, he uses the language of his day. When When an enemy army was defeated in Isaiah's day, their dead body would lie out and waste. But in the eternal state, these people will not be unconsciously dead. They will be conscious in the the state of eternal torment. And Jesus says their worm will not die, their fire is not quenched. In other words, they are going to be there for all of eternity. It's it's a never-ending situation. But Jesus clearly sees these verses pointing to the eternal state, not simply a temporary state in the millennium. Can we move to Ezekiel? All right, guys, (laughs) this is going to be hard to do. We might have to introduce it and pick it up next week. Yeah, maybe so. Uh, Let's let's go to uh, Ezekiel chapter 40. That's a good chapter. Certainly, we're moving into the, uh, the lesser-known territory of Ezekiel. Just to refresh you really fast here with, with the book of, of uh, Ezekiel. Okay, this, this is way too simple. Okay, way too simple. The first about 11 chapters of Ezekiel is the people have sinned and sinned and sinned. And God's glory, remember it's, there's a throne chariot with wheels underneath it. God's glory leaves the Holy of Holies It goes up on the Mount of Olives across from Jerusalem's capital, uh, in the capital, and it ascends up into heaven and takes off. It's gone. God's glory has abandoned the temple, and God is leaving the temple to be destroyed by the Babylonians. Ezekiel lives through this time while in Babylon, and he gets promises about the future. In chapter 34 and and around there, he, he has promised that there will be a new shepherd, a new David who will come. In chapter 36 and 37, we're told that God will give his people a new heart. He'll he'll remove their sins. He'll give them a new heart. 37, his spirit will create life from the dead, the valley of dry bones. He will bring his people back to life. Chapter 38 and 39 covers the final battle. Remember Gog and Magog. 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 That's in uh, Revelation 19 and 20. The final battle where God's enemies are obliterated. And then right when you're expecting, according to the New Testament, to walk into the eternal state, right? After the final battle, we walk into the new heavens, the new Jerusalem. You have Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48. The last nine chapters of Ezekiel. And just if you have never read these chapters or if you haven't read them in a while, for a good portion of these chapters, Ezekiel is getting a vision of, it looks like, a renewal of Jerusalem with a very literal, uh, you know, blueprint here of a rebuilding. We'll, we'll talk about how literal it is in a second, but you could take it this way, as a literal rebuilding of a temple in Jerusalem. And the idea is that Levitical priests will be back at work, animal sacrifice will be offered again, God's glory will return to the temple, and it says at the very end of the book of, of, of Ezekiel, uh, the, the famous last statement, Yahweh Shama, the Lord is there. The name of the city from that time on will be the Lord is there. Yahweh is there. And that's how it is. Now, a lot of people think, I I strongly disagree, but I I understand why. A lot of people think Ezekiel 40 to 48 is describing the millennium basically only. It's just about the millennium. It's about a physical, literal, rebuilt temple in Jerusalem in this world that will last for a thousand years while Christ reigns on earth before the final new creation. And that there will be, listen, this is, if you've never heard this, this is shocking, honestly. Uh, they, they teach that, many of these teach that literal animal sacrifice will be opened back up, commanded by God, because it's in these chapters, that would be literal priests who offer literal animal sacrifices, and they say it's not to atone for sin, but these animals are sacrificed, pointing backwards in recognition and thanksgiving for Christ's past sacrifice. Now, I have a huge problem with this, namely the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews says... Animal sacrifice was all a precursor to Jesus, pointing to Jesus. 
Once the final lamb of God comes, there is no need any longer for the blood of bulls and goats. There is no need for them. In fact, to revert to the whole system of animal sacrifice all over again is to misunderstand Jesus. And so Hebrews says there's no place for a future of animal sacrifice. Let's just leave that behind. It's part of the old covenant. But if this is literally going to be fulfilled literalistically in the future, there's going to be animal sacrifice in Jerusalem to the glory of Jesus for his sacrifice on the cross. It gets very confusing. Greg, some thoughts on these chapters. Yeah, again, going back to what we said at the beginning, speaking of um, an ideal, um, idealistically in the categories of his day, like the city and the temple that you read about in Ezekiel 40 through 48 is incredible to look at. Like it's huge. It's laid out just perfectly. Um, but again, the, the presence of sacrifices, like as, new, as those who have received Jesus, we've received the New Testament, we've got the, the teaching of the apostles, um, to say that that, meant that is intended to be literalistically, physically fulfilled at some future point after Jesus has come um, is to create a tension in the text that is a dangerous tension. Um, look at, listen to Hebrews chapter 8. He, the author here talks about, he quotes Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, the, the big passage on the new covenant. And he says this in verse 13. He says, in speaking of a new covenant... He makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Meaning, once the new comes, there's no more place for the old. There's no more place for it. It's done. It it anticipated uh, the new. It anticipated all that the new brings about. Um, In the old covenant, like repeatedly, these things cannot take away sins. The, The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. Um, it's insufficient, it's incomplete, it can't do what we need done. And Jesus is the reality to which it pointed. He's the one who fulfills everything that we need to be right with God. Jesus brings in, Hebrews is so clear with that, and once this new covenant is brought about, we don't go back to the old covenant. To go back to the old covenant is to abandon Jesus. That's one of the main arguments of the book of Hebrews, writing to Jewish Christians who are facing apostasy going back to Judaism because Judaism wasn't persecuted by the Roman Empire like Christianity was. Once Christianity was separated in the minds of the Romans as something distinct from Judaism, it no longer had the protection that the Jews did. And so as Christians are undergoing persecution, they're thinking, if I go back to Judaism, to to the old covenant, I'll be safe. I won't be persecuted. And the whole argument is, if you do that, you abandon Jesus. Okay? Okay. That's one of the main arguments of the book of Hebrews. You go back to the old ways, you're turning away from Jesus, you're crucifying him again, you're rejecting him, um, you prove that you were never saved to begin with. And so the whole argument of Hebrews is everything that we need you have in Jesus. He's supreme, he's sufficient, his sacrifice lasts, it's forever, he's better in every way. And so to say then that there's going to be a period of time when we go back to the very things that couldn't save us, that couldn't help us ultimately, that pointed forward to him, it goes against the whole grain of Hebrews and of the New Testament. And we're not saying that Ezekiel's wrong. Like That's the thing. We're not saying Ezekiel's wrong. Well, On that very point, why I don't think Ezekiel... So how, how is Ezekiel's vision fulfilled? If there isn't... If we don't think there's going to be future animal sacrifice, here's what I would say. Listen, hear me out here. Ezekiel is speaking to people who don't know anything other than a literal temple and God's literal glory filling the temple and animal sacrifice. That's all they know. And so Ezekiel is speaking of something that's going to go beyond that. He's speaking of the horse and buggy when the car is coming. He's speaking of animal sacrifice when the Lamb of God is coming in the future. And when Jesus comes, how we see these, these, these chapters fulfilled, it is still going to happen. It's still going to be fulfilled, but in new covenant categories. And what I mean is... Instead of Levitical priests, we have Jesus, the great high priest. Instead of animal sacrifice, we have Jesus, the Lamb of God, the last sacrifice. Instead of a physical earthly temple, we have Jesus, the temple of God, and his church, the temple of God, and the renewed creation, which is like a new temple of God, but not a literal building with literal animals and literal blood and literal Levitical priests. Turn to Ezekiel 47 uh, as we run lower on time. Ezekiel 47, I just want to read a few verses here, and I'll flip to Revelation in a moment. Listen to this vision, which I think is highly symbolic, even when it was written. Ezekiel 47, verse 1. 
Then, uh, this is a vision, he took me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from before the threshold, below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around to the outside of the outer gate that faces toward the east, and behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. And it goes on, verse uh, 7, as I went back, I saw on the bank of the river many trees, very many trees, on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region. It goes down into the Arabah and enters into the, into the sea, that is the Dead Sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. So the Dead Sea will become fresh. Wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live, and there will be very many fish, for this water goes before there, uh, goes there, and the waters of the sea, that they may become fresh. Look at verse 12. On the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Now, hold your spot after hearing that and turn to the very end of your Bible. Look at Revelation 22, the last chapter, and see how John sees Ezekiel's vision fulfilled in his, in his own vision. Look at Revelation 22, verse 1, and see if he's picking up on Ezekiel here. Revelation 22, verse 1, then the angel showed me the river, sound familiar, of the water of life, brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. This is Ezekiel's vision fulfilled. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, like Ezekiel told us about with its 12 kinds of fruit, one for each month, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, etc. Now turn back to Revelation 21, verse 22. Just before that, he's seeing Ezekiel's vision fulfilled. Look what he says in Revelation 21, verse 22. And I saw no what? Temple temple, no physical building of a temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Are you seeing the horse and buggy turning into the car? Are you seeing what John's doing? He takes this old covenant idea of animal sacrifice, physical temple, and trees on both sides of the river, and he sees it fulfilled not in the millennium. There's no reference to this in the, in the millennium. He sees it fulfilled where? In the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and earth, with, with the Trees on both sides of the river. He sees the water of life flowing from God's throne. And he sees no literal physical building of a temple. Because who's the temple? God himself is the temple. And so Ezekiel's temple is fulfilled not in brick and mortar, but in Jesus. Jesus is the true temple. There's no physical building of a temple in the eternal state. God himself is the temple. Well, and one more thought on that too. Ezekiel's temple and the city that is described is big enough for all the people of God. Right. The new heavens and the new earth. Um, it's in the shape of a cube like the Holy of Holies. Um, it's big enough to contain all the people of God. The whole city in Ezekiel, not just the temple, the whole city is holy to the Lord, just like the, that inner room in the back of the temple. So again, we see, we see Ezekiel pointing forward to something so great that you can't really understand it until it comes, and even then we're doing our best to make sense of it. You know, but... God is the temple. Like, you think about that. God and the Lamb are our temple in the new heavens, in the new earth, um, which is greater than any physical building could ever be. So it, here, here's kind of wrapping this up. The very well-known so-called premillennial prophecies from the Old Testament prophets, we find them being referred to by John, not in the millennium text of Revelation 20, but these so-called millennial passages are fulfilled where? Over and over and over in the new Jerusalem, in the new heavens and new earth. So John is our guide here, right? He's our inspired guide to know how to interpret these difficult prophecies. And how does he see them fulfilled? He sees them fulfilled ultimately in the new Jerusalem, the, the new heavens and new earth. So we do believe those prophecies all come to pass, but some of them in unexpected ways because of how they are fulfilled in Jesus. So Papa Frank, can you pray for us? I'm going to read first from uh, Revelation 22, verse um, 17. The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, the book of the prophecy. God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. 
He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with us all. Father God, um, thank you for these closing words. It, it, it expresses the, the gravity, the gravitas of the words, the very words that we've been studying, as well as the allusions from the um, Old Testament books of Isaiah and Ezekiel. And, and there are many others, Zechariah and, and, and other the prophets, that testify to uh, the truth of what is written in Revelation. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to study these words and uh, bless our worship today, uh, the prayers, the singing, the celebration, the glory to your glory, O oh Lord. Amen. Amen. So thank you guys again. We plan to be back in the gym for Sunday school next week, and we will see you all then.